Hello, Terry here, and thank you for tuning into the Animation Industry Podcast. Today I am chatting with a super skilled 2D animator from Australia who is also pretty Instagram famous and just an overall super great dude. But first, I have a sponsored message to share with you. It comes from my friends over at Bloop Animation, which is an animation learning platform packed with premium online video courses for aspiring animation filmmakers. They have courses for all major animation programs like Maya, Animate CC, Toon Boom, Blender, TV Paint, and many others, as well as some non-software courses like a storyboarding course, animation foundations course, and even one about making graphic novels, which covers absolutely everything you need to know from start to finish. The courses are all in video form, so there's no deadlines or application process. You just simply pick a course and start learning in seconds. And they even offer a free ebook titled Making an Animated Short, which covers their entire process step by step of how they made one of their films from coming up with the idea to storyboarding, animation, and all the way to exporting the film. And you can get that book for free at bloopanimation.com slash animation industry. And you can check out their complete course library at bloopanimation.com slash courses. And I'll include those links in the description of this podcast. So make sure you check those out. Now back to today's guest. The person I am chatting with today is the wiggly wobbly Neil Sanders, who I know very well for his wiggly wobbly animations on Instagram, where he's probably got like 1000 super cute loops posted, which I think are called booglies because his name is the boogly over there. But anyway, if you're not familiar with him from Instagram, you've probably seen some of his work since he did the Fallout 4 intro animations and he worked on the animation for Tonks Island Pilot for Nickelodeon, which if you haven't seen yet, please go watch it right now. It just may be the cutest thing you will see all year. Plus, he did the backdrop animation for the Chainsmokers last tour and he just helps out in general on a lot of projects at Rubber House with Ivan Dixie and Greg Sharp. So Neil, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing today? Yeah, good, man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just FYI, you're all the way in Australia, so it's super early in the morning for you right now, and it's like the evening for me. Yeah, I was going to wear my pajamas, just a joke. But then... Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear my dog squeaking? I have to I have to take his toy away from him. Just a second. <laughs> He's going to be really sad now. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah, so, well, thanks for coming on the chat today. Uh, there are a few things I want to talk about, and one is your journey into the wonderful world of animation in Australia and what that's like. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to chat about how to get creating if you don't know where to start or find inspiration to keep going and create things all the time. And then you're also a teacher, which is uh, a, a professor, I guess, um, which is also very uh, interesting experience that I want to hear about as well, teaching students and preparing them for the big wide world of illustration and animation and all that. And then um, you also run Loop to Loop. Uh, and if you don't know what Loop to Loop is, it's like a monthly looping animation challenge that you run. So I want to talk about all of those things. So let's start at the beginning when uh, Neil was an itty bitty baby and uh, got a pencil for the first time. What happened? Um, I didn't really take drawing seriously or probably any any kind of academic stuff seriously until I was like year 10. Did you have a careers counselor in year 10? Like say, what uh, you yeah, we, it was called civics class and they like, you have to make a resume and you get a big giant book of every university program you can take and you have to like pick one. Mm. Yeah. Really scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we did it one on one and they kind of, uh, it'd be like, um, like a cattle grid, like just one at a time, go through. And then they, you know, bolt gun you to the head with the job you're going to do for the rest of your life, kind of, you know. Oh, my uh, God. And I said that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to draw pictures for a living because I, I thought that's what everyone says I'm good at in my little school. Um, and the teacher was just like, well, you have to get really good at it. So then yeah. I don't know if it was the effect that she, the result that she wanted, but for the next two years, I didn't do very much academically. I just focused on art and I had this big sketchbook. I've got it here somewhere. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ugh. All through high school, I just drew and drew. So I got a day to a page diary in year 12 and just every day filled it. Oh, wow. 
just okay. draw it. You know, so drawing. I love that you still have that. Yeah, were yeah, you, I, I keep everything. Were you just drawing out of your head, or were you taking like I don't know, like getting instruction books or uh, whatever? Still... I'm assuming the wonderful world of YouTube wasn't really developed at that point. <laughs> no, no, you're just in isolation. So. Um... It's kind of the usual thing that, oh, maybe it isn't usual anymore because they do have YouTube and all that stuff. But we used to, you know, just get magazines, cut out pictures, copy pictures of, of, of people that you like, uh, raging hormones, drawing lots of pretty girls and stuff like that. <laughs> just fucking nonsense. Um, but just drawing and drawing and drawing, you know, because that's what I thought I should do. Um, and there was a media class, so I did a little bit of animation in there at home on an Amiga, which is like a really old computer. Um, and then I finished year 12 with terrible results, but a really good folio. Nice. And I, I did these big paintings on Masonite and I had to, I had to go on the train. So I had these, I had three big sheets of Masonite, a sketchbook, a bunch of other graphic design stuff. Uh, it was probably about 15 kilos worth of stuff. <laughs> I was just lugging it on the train and then to to interviews at all the different colleges. And um, I got pretty much like because I, I did so bad academically that I got rejected at a few. But a couple, they just saw all of the work and didn't really care about anything else, which was what I was hoping for. Um, and but I was like 18 at the time. So, I, you know, they usually force you to do some other little thing for a year but one of them sort of said what what will you do if you if you don't get in and I was just like I'll, I'll be doing this anyway I just won't have any instruction <laughs> so <laughs> they accepted me and, and got me in yeah nice well way to be super honest <laughs> yeah. um, what was the biggest thing that helped you feel kind of confident to do that was it that year 10 teacher saying to you like you just have to get really good like what was that driving force where you're like, I'm going to do this anyways, this is what I like to do, and I'm going to go to every college and see who's going to accept me? I don't know. I think I've always been fairly encouraged at home by my parents. Um, we, were, we were poor, but I didn't really know we were poor. Um, I'm always never, never really wanting for anything. Uh, they made ends meet without, you know, making it, the kids problem which i'm really impressed with them looking back on that that's amazing sometimes you know like grocery shopping would be really careful with a list and all of this sort of stuff but it was just like that's just what we do you know yeah, um right. yeah so it was just that encouragement and, and my just general ignorance you know just like <laughs> this, is, this is what i want to do this is what i'm going to keep doing and I, I still like that now like i i don't compromise very often. I've probably missed a bunch of opportunities for that reason of like, I remember when I graduated, the first freelance gig I got, um, I was living in a bubble at the time. We were, we were minding my now wife's brother's house on the beach in Sydney. We had this apartment and it was amazing and we weren't paying rent. We were just living in there. And that was the first time I'd been out of home. So I just thought that was life. I just living it up and um i got this gig doing um it was the first internet bubble i don't know how old you would have been when um the first internet bubble was like amazing so ebay doesn't exist yet youtube's still like five six years off and everyone's like doing things with the internet and creating businesses hoping that they'll find a way to to exist um if you get wayback machine you can go back and have a look at them yeah um at that time, like um, there was a internet um, flash animation internet TV company called Icebox, and you paid a monthly fee to watch their content. And they had John Kay making a show. They had um, oh, what were them? there were some amazing ones on there. There was one like Abraham Lincoln, but he's like a, a filthy um, swearing tiny Abraham Lincoln with a massive hat. Um, hard drinking Lincoln, it was called. There was a bunch of shows like that, and it it kind of came and went. So I got the, this gig working for a for a company that were up there in Sydney, 
and they sort of said, do you want to come on full time? And I was like, yeah, I'll freelance, you know, this is awesome. I'll just freelance. And I did a couple of gigs for them, but I could have just been working in their studio and learning an absolute ton. Um, yeah. At that time, vector animation, like so flash and, and drawing with Adobe Illustrator was kind of king because the inset was really slow. JPEGs loaded down into the screen really slowly. So vectors loaded instantly. Um, so I was doing vector animation or vector drawings that they were animating. I was drawing the assets. I didn't know how to animate in Flash yet. I did a little bit, but I, it looked too hard and I put it away. I didn't know how to do it. Um, so yeah, that was an opportunity. I could have, I could have instantly been in the animation industry and I just didn't do it. <laughs> what, a, what a twist. So did you ever, I mean, looking back now, um, did you ever have moments where you, like my previous question was about where'd you get the confidence from? Did you ever kind of feel the opposite? Like, what am I doing? Um, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I think drawing is the, is the one thing that I always feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, everything else weird, everything else, the world is weird, you know? Yeah. So as long as you're drawing, everything makes sense. Yeah, like you know, you know how everything works. I mean, okay, good. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like you're in the right career. That so, like, maybe yeah. you can just give a snapshot of where you are right now. Um, so now I teach four days a week. Um, it's uh, TAFE. It's a uh, like the, like a trade school, but we've got a visual arts department. So I teach illustration there. Um, for the next four weeks, I'll be teaching animation introductory exercises um just as a way to wind down for these guys it's their last four weeks of the of the course so they've been doing they they've done um some really um intensive like character design projects and they've just finished their branding project which was you know very introspective and trying to figure out what their work is and how best to market it and all of that so it's been really intense so we're just going to wind down with you know four and four weeks of animation exercises and just kind of give them a taste of it with no okay. stakes to that, because they, they're not going into that unless they want to. Um, yeah, one thing I, I want them to have at the end of it is, I see a lot of people like decide they're going to study animation before they've actually tried it. And um, you want to know if you can do it, <laughs> if you can stomach it, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I get asked that a lot with stop motion. A lot of people reach out to me and say, where do I, how do I get started? What do I need? And it's, it's like, just start because you'll find out if you actually want to do it once you're in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the people who in the people who stay in it are the ones who really love it. And if you don't love it, you're like, it's, you're not going to be in it. So yeah, I, I totally get that with animation too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my whole idea from, from go to one bit, the main advice I give the students is just draw it, just, just get in there and do it. If it's bad, we can fix it. You know, if, if you're not doing it, then your brain is going to embellish the idea and embellish the idea and embellish the idea to the point. And I remember it when I was a kid, you, you have a dream or you create an idea in your head and then you can never express it. It might be because it's not something you should be drawing. It might be something you should be writing, trying to evoke the thoughts that you're having in other people or something else. But so I draw... And then that feeds my imagination and then I draw some more and, you know, back and forth. It's a conversation between your pen and your head. Um, yeah. The worst thing you can do is, is, is wait, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I, I, I definitely like how you put that, you know, embellish it, embellish it. And it should be more of a conversation because, yeah, I definitely have those ideas that in my mind I've been thinking about for years and they've, they're like ridiculously formed from like so many different experiences. And if I ever try to put it out there, it's not going to be what I want it to be, I guess, because it, it was never a back and forth evolving thing. It was just this build up to something that, mm. you know, doesn't really exist. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, taking so you, and collaborating with someone on them is, is good yeah, to try and boil them back to the original nugget and then try and draw that hmm. or like a moment from it or something, but it's really hard to, to shrink it back down. And all, all of my favorite things are tiny, generally, 
Like they're, they're tiny ideas that are then expanded upon. Like I really like that um, that Tarantino movie that just came out. Like okay. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it. It's 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 a slog of a of a thing, like a seventies movie should be, which is pretty much what he makes. That it's it's just one idea about you know Hollywood in the in the seventies and, and Manson and all of that stuff. Like what if that played out differently? And then it's just a day in the life kind of thing, and it just plays out in real time. It's like it's really easily boiled down to a simple single nugget, um, but then you embellish and embellish and embellish from that, rather than it being like needlessly complex. Yeah. 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 Mm. Well, I mean, the simplest ideas are always the best to communicate, easiest to communicate, I guess, and it's what you do in the execution that really builds it out as a fully realized thing versus you know that embellishment ahead of time what you just said so do you where you're at now so you're teaching four days a week i know you're also animating every single day for instagram um are you kind of living that i guess the conversation kind of dream between your your thoughts and your pencil that you just talked about is that is that where you say where you say you're at right now i guess yeah, I mean, thing, are you still working towards a different state? Maybe I don't. I'm kind of. I've got. I've got two kids now, so I've got two boys. One's seven, and one's just about nine. So, like, I can't really take on any of those bigger freelance gigs that I that I that I did. So I'm kind of treading water at the moment, and mm. just just making sure I'm, I'm keeping my hand busy, making things, keeping interested. And, uh, and that's, I'm enjoying this period probably more than, like commercial work is full on. Like yeah. it's, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those eighties shows or seventies shows where the, the parent catches their kids smoking and then makes them smoke a whole carton. Yeah. Oh, you're like drawing, do you? Like, you'd have the same. Like, you like stop motion. Well, here's fucking keep stop. Do it constantly for, for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Do it for 14 hours a day. And let's see if you still like it. Well, I, I did that and I still like it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Uh, stop, stop motion for me is like, I will forget to eat, go to the bathroom. I will forget to like move, like, it's, it's almost like bad for my health because I just get so carried away in my own space and I can do it forever. So mm -hmm. in one aspect, I love it. In another aspect, I come out at the end of the day and I'm like ruined physically. So I have to build in those uh, health breaks and stuff. But no, I totally get what you mean. Like, so with your kids now, are you exposing them to the wonderful world of illustration and animation and seeing how they take it? Yeah, yeah, they love drawing and, and making things and stuff like that. Um, when we first started the loop to loop stuff, they used to come along and things like that. And um, I started making a kid friendly edit because I, I I realized how how filthy <laughs> a lot of it was. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, and it, now they're at an age where they're like, they're really aware of what's appropriate and what's not. So mm. they help me make the kid friendly edit. Like there's some sometimes there's borderline, and I'm like, it's not going to be a problem. Let's just see what you think. And it's like I've started cutting things that kids wouldn't get. Like at first I was like, oh, I'll cut the things that are like traumatizing. But then there were just jokes that are just like, why would a kid care? You know, there's like a, a Tinder app or something like that gag. There's a lot of Tinder app gags because it's easy to make a loop of swipe, 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 swipe. What does a kid care? <laughs> <laughs> right. They don't yeah. at that stage. They want like a fart joke or something, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or melting or something. Yeah, visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Melt. Uh, so maybe this can lead into like um, where I kind of started following you, which is Instagram, because you make a lot of uh, character loops there. Um, so I think I discovered you two or three years ago now. And you've made looping characters, I guess I call them booglies, I don't know what you call them, um, <laughs> every single day since then, and they're quite amazing. And especially, you've been turning them into Gifly gifts you, that people can like use in their stories. So why did you, let's talk about that a little bit, because um, I want to lead into like how to get started and keep motivation going every day. So what made you start that in the first place? Uh, 
know. I have long commutes. So when I started studying, so that, that train ride I took carrying all that heavy stuff, yeah. that was my course from then on. And I had a little ah. box and a sketchbook and I would just draw on the ske- in the sketchbook. It was about an hour and a half each way to travel because I live in like an outer suburb of Melbourne. I'm, I'm back here again now. I've moved, I've moved closer to town and when we had the kids moved back out here. Um, yeah, comfort zone, I guess, of like, you know, I know this area. I know it's really good for yeah. kids. Yeah. I know when they're teenagers, they'll get bored and they'll want to leave, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd be on the train just drawing all the time. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the weird kid on the train with the sketchbook, drawing people, drawing anything. Um, and I've just carried that through. Like, yeah. I just commute on the train and I try and it's a nice little one hour window from here to the city where I could probably sometimes when I was working on that chain smoker stuff, um, like I, I did two songs backdrops for the, for their tour. And then they were, they, they decided they wanted me to do don't let me down as well, which is like their, their big hit. They were doing that as a big finale thing. So they wanted me to make a bunch of little loops for that. Uh Um, and I was already pretty burned out from all the other stuff. And like, I, I just on the right road into work, um, they wanted some roughs real quick. And I, on the right road into work, I just busted out in my journal, like four different really quick loops of just animating. I use like two sheets of paper that are thin paper. It, it, sometimes I, I, I was really fetishizing what the paper would be for a while. And now I, then I didn't have anything one day and I just grabbed a lunch bag off the ground that someone had, you know, thrown away as rubbish. And I just used that and it was perfect. Like just a stinky old pie pa- pie wrapper. Um, yeah, I got, I got like four little loops done on the road in and they ended up being like, I, I scanned them, I put them in the computer and then I, I refined them in flash, but there's something really nice and immediate about it. And it takes you back to the original magic of not knowing what it's going to look like. Hmm. Um, if I animate, you've, you've probably got that magic anyway, cause you're using stop mo. So you go straight ahead most of the time. But, um, if I'm doing stuff in the computer, I'll just tune out and just kind of flick back and forth between the couple of frames that I've drawn. And then I might draw another one and then I'll flick through those for ages and I'll watch it and I'll second guess and I'll change things all the time. But when I'm busting these ones out on the train, you don't know what it's going to look like till it's finished. And then it becomes this game of like, how weird, how weird can I make this? Can I make that go to that? And that's the ones that people like the most are the really freaky, like, how does that even work? <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Mm. How did you even, how did the chain smokers get in touch with you in the first place? Has that come about because of your Instagram loops or the loop to loop? It was, I, th- I'm, I don't know if it's the stuff I've done with Rubber House. Mm. Or if it's just like I, I got on board the Tumblr train at the right time. And I thought like I used to post to Newgrounds when I first started animating. Do you know Newgrounds? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a nice like little little sort of paddle pool to sort of swim in and play with. And and the feedback you get from a 13 year old is so brutal. Like they just know what they like and what they don't like. And they don't give a shit how hard it was. <laughs> um, you get really good feedback from that and i just thought that would be similar on tumblr like here's where all the kids are let's see what the kids like and it turned out all the artists were there as well and um when i got popular on, on i was popular on Newgrounds, and i was like oh that's fun the kids like it those guys have grown up like felix colgrave is a freaking legend now and he was just like 13 when i started like seeing his stuff on Newgrounds or whatever. It's like 15, maybe. He's always been amazing, though. Um, but, yeah, the Chainsmokers guys, I don't know how they, they found me, but they contacted me through Instagram message, Tumblr, and Facebook message. No email. Um, and I'd never heard of them because I'm old. I'm like 40 <laughs> next month. So I thought they were like a punk band. Oh you no! Know, it's all the time, and they're like, "We've got like five hundred bucks. Can you make us a music video or whatever?" So I went, "All right, I'll look them up on YouTube." I go to YouTube, and the first track I see has got a billion views. <laughs> I was like, "What? The f- this is amazing!" 
So, you know, get straight back to them, have a video chat. And, um, no, I'm sorry, they wanted, they wanted 500 bucks from you or they wanted to give you 500 bucks? No, 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 they, they, they paid really well. They were amazing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, um, oh, I'm gonna, it's, a, it's a, a French guy. Um, um, he goes by Cada uh, Cadavra Exquis. I'm terrible. Fucking terrible. Uh, but Production Club is the is the production company. Okay. And then um, yeah, Francois, who goes by Cadav Exquis. Um, uh, it was amazing. Like they they were just so good, so approachable, so nice. Like, yeah, it was fantastic to work nice. with and and to play. And then like I didn't go to any of the concerts because I'm over here, but yeah. like. I would sit and I just hover over Instagram and check the hashtag and people, you know, at the concert would be filming it. And there's all these pyrotechnics going off with your animation playing behind it. Um, I did one, one track that I did, uh, the choreographer worked with the, the chain smokers guys and, um, she did a dance. They learned the dance. They filmed the dance, sent it to me. I animated the dance kind of, kind of rotoscoped, but with a, with a simple character. And then during the concert, they dance with the thing behind them. In oh, no time. Way. Yeah. So the I first one was a nightmare. Like it, it, the, they weren't in sync at all, but by the end of the tour, they, they nailed it. it was <laughs> really fun. Yeah. Mm. I've seen the chain smokers, so I wonder if I might have seen your animation on the big screen too. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah, yeah. So it's like a French, the uh, uh, Francois from Goblins. Okay. Yeah. So it's really overwhelming. Really, um, I don't know that fraud complex thing kicked in of like. Yeah, oh. yeah. I was gonna ask. That's <laughs> awesome though. So, yeah. um, I I kind of want to ask more about the Instagram thing, just because you talked about doing it on the train. Is it? Do you consider it like more? Is it work for you? Like, oh, I got to get this done to post to Instagram today. Or is it like, well, yeah. tell me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's the 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 uh, latency. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> me too. Um, it's um, it's like doing a Sudoku puzzle for me. Like I just sit and I do it, you know. And it's it's the it's yeah. fun and it's it's enjoyable. But it's pretty much like doing a puzzle, and then I just I'm post it. I'm impressed at how you get each drawing to like match up perfectly like with the volume and the line weight and everything even though you're you're drawing it all on the same sheet like you're not no, overlapping. It's two sheets it's two sheets, oh, it's two sheets. so yeah, you're cheating yeah, yeah i cheat, <laughs> I cheat. <laughs> so you draw one and then you trace it and then you trace it trace it trace yeah, it trace it yeah oh, okay no wonder here i'm less impressed now <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah sometimes it's straight ahead sometimes it's pose to pose or a mix of the two yeah. i've got to figure out how to I'll have an extreme and then I'll have probably the other extreme and then I'll figure out how to get them, link them up. And then I just keep drawing for a bit to figure out the timing. Then I number them and figure out what needs to go in between and just keep tracing back and forth till the sheets are full. Yeah. So Everyone it's thinks it's magical, but it's not. Yeah. Well, it is because you do it and nobody else is doing it. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Oh, yeah. So Anything you do. So you have work. like, almost 12,000 followers now and it's mm. still growing. Um, yeah. What have you received any like, I don't know, uh, what are some of the highlights of having that many followers on Instagram for you? I don't know. I'm not as I've like, never... is anything out of it or is it just like I'm doing this anyway. So if people follow me, that's nice. You're not you're not purposely trying to. No, no, I'm not purposely. I mean, I want I want to share my work and have it out there and people to see it and enjoy it. Um, I think like Tumblr, I, I really love Tumblr because people took a little sense of ownership and they'd share your work. Mm. And like sometimes like people would share it and they'd delete your name and things like that. And that would be a, a bit off putting. Um, but I guess like, I don't know what it's like in Canada. I know in America you have to register your copyright, but in Australia it's free and automatic. We just own our copyright. Yeah. Same here. It's yeah, free yeah, and automatic. Yeah. So good. So good. Just, just you know, so th there's an emboldening that comes with that. And also we have unemployment benefits. So there's an, uh, there's an emboldening that comes with that too. We have that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, you, you sort of, 
there's a, there's an extra layer of stress that I think is involved in being an American that, you know, it, it means that they probably take less risks, I think, in their, mm. in their creativity because they, they need to burn money. They need to make a living. That loop-to-loop -loop thing I run, the bar in the city, they, we just have a show. You know, it, it was there waiting for us. Uh, and it's not going anywhere. And we don't pay for it. They make their money off the bar. Um, but when we started doing it in uh, L.A., then it was like, we need venue, we need money for this, we need to figure out a, a revenue stream, uh, we need to approach people for sponsorships. It became this huge thing. Whereas for yeah, me, yeah. like the hard work is just getting the animations together and compiling it. Do you, do um, you think that is, um, because that makes sense to me, uh, like getting sponsorships to, you know, get, hold it in a bar. Do you think hmm. it's, if you went any city in Australia, you would yep. have no problem getting into a bar? Yeah, 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 we've got them in uh, Brisbane, Sydney, and uh, Adelaide. They all oh, have wow. as well. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, because I'm wondering about that here in Canada. I'm sure you can find like a local bar that doesn't mind. But if you want to go to like a bigger place, for sure, you're going to have to rent it out. They're going to have a minimum, uh, mm. like spend all that stuff. So especially in Toronto, um, yeah. where it's like you know it's everything's so expensive. Yeah. Um, but that's that's really interesting, and I, I kind of I'm trying to figure out a way to segue into something that you said earlier to me uh, off the off this chat was um, creating more than you consume as like a philosophy yeah, yeah. that you, you've had. So I'm wondering, can you can you talk about that? Because obviously, you know, you've you're you're not intentionally trying to turn your Instagram animations into like a revenue stream or something like that. You're creating every single day with the purpose of just enjoying your commute, sharing your work out there. And obviously, naturally, you've had a lot of success. So like, for instance, you have uh, almost 12,000 followers. You have like the loop to loop thing. It's being played in multiple cities around Australia, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So maybe you can just share your philosophy on creating more than you can consume or than you consume. It sounds, it, it, yeah, it sounds really um full on at first but then like the idea is you spend more time creating things than you do consuming things so like i was obsessed with video games uh as a teen and you you like i don't know street fighter 2 was my poison and i would just sit there and play that again and again and again um and as i transitioned into studying and finding that balance and I see it in my students and I see it all the time is that like when someone's when I was studying I thought well when I'm at, at school that's like I'm at work then I knock off and I come home and then I play my video games or, you know I don't know what I was doing yeah I don't know I, I look back on that and just think of all the wasted time because now I have kids and it's like there is no time to waste you've just got to be working all the time to you know get them get them ready get yourself ready get everything done and then there's a little bit of downtime at the end of the day um the yeah so like my thinking is that you want to spend more time making things than you do watching or playing or any of that stuff you still need that you need that balance. And I think like you can you can tip the scales the other way too much, which I've done in the past as well, is like completely turn off all things, you know, get I sort of had a little fundamentalist moment with video games where I was like, I'm not going to play them at all. But then you lose that connection to culture and you start taking the stuff that you're doing too seriously and get too bogged down in making. You need to take in culture, but you need to like create it as well. Yeah. That balance is really important. So, yeah. oh, so one thing I'm struggling with is like right now I'm treating like school and the podcast and like my assignments and my own stop motion. Like everything is like very, I'm treating everything very seriously and I'm not spending yeah. a lot of time playing. Like I, I play like Pokemon Go while I'm walking my dog and that's my, that's my like release of uh, <laughs> where my downtime really, I don't, I don't really schedule downtime unless somebody like, one of my friends is like, hey, let's hang out or something. Um, so what what is the issue, I guess? You said uh, one issue is not connecting with culture. Um, why is it important to to have that more, creating more and consuming less that you just talked about or finding a good balance? 
don't know. To me, I I want to make things. Yeah. If I, if I like my wife <laughs> would tell you, if I don't draw for a whole day, and then I go to bed and I get up the next day, I'll be I'll just be a cranky turd of a person, you know. Yeah. I need to, I need to draw. It's a compulsion, you know. It's a way of it's a way of being in the world for me. But at the same time, I need to consume culture so that I'm, you know, I'm aware of what's happening around me and um, I, I have a story to tell. You know, if, if, if I just sit and, and draw and I don't go outside and, and don't experience culture or don't have conversations and things like that, it all just becomes this kind of, I don't know, you see comic artists do it because they're, they're shut-ins quite often. They'll draw a comic about drawing a comic and then a comic about drawing a comic about drawing a comic. And there's this, this anxiety that comes around that stuff. And like, yeah. that's, that's really charming and it's really uh, personal. But at the same time, it's just like a symptom of not experiencing enough, not having a story to tell. I, yeah. I like how you put that. I haven't really thought about that before. But like, your, what I've come to realize is very important for myself is like my own story over the last couple of years. Like, my, mm. my story is like, you know, grew up, did animation, quit that, went to business school, quit that, et cetera. And mm. like, I find a lot of personal fulfillment and value in the path that I'm taking because of my story. Versus like, if I was always, like, if I'm always working, my story just becomes, I'm always working. Yeah, I mean, finding... it doesn't mean you have to like suddenly be an introvert, um, an extrovert or anything like that. Like, um, my favorite example of someone who, who does that really well would be Nick Park, like mm. the Wallace and Gromit, just that really minute attention to detail about everyday life. Like, yes, yeah. Getting up. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's indoor, it's in the house, and, but it's really carefully observed and then replicated the way that he would go about his daily routine. Oh, sure. yeah. That's, he, he's that's what makes it come alive, though. I think if you took out those nuances, the stories would be boring. They'd be like, oh, this is like everything else. Yeah, but yeah. I think like when you see like the crackers and cheese thing or like the whatever, how he puts on it, like, you know, it just mm. makes it takes it to a different level. Yeah. yeah. So um, you've learned that you can't not draw every day. Is there anything else that you like big realizations you've had from from doing this process every day for years? Um, I don't know. That there is an audience for it, I guess. Yeah. And that there's, a, there's something really valuable about the, the grind of doing it and doing it and doing it and doing some of that in a vacuum so that you, you go somewhere really personal and individual because like my work is is popular and recognizable because it's weird <laughs> not not because i'm i'm copying anyone else or or yeah i don't know maybe part of it is because we're we're isolated down here in melbourne um our education is further afield than the big schools like i've i've heard you talk to quite a few other people on the podcast and the schools they go to is really important you know it's like they need to go to Sheridan or CalArts or Goblins or wherever. Uh, is it Goblin? Goblin. Goblin. Yeah, yeah. I had to practice so many times before that episode. Yeah, I nearly got chased out of France. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even ask for a baguette without getting like told off. <laughs> oh my gosh. Because I'm no good. I'm no good at French. And but then I'd they, they'd be like, what the hell? And I'd, I'd try it in English, and they'd be like, you need to speak French. And I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I went to Italy because I know a bit of Italian and I coped. I coped in Italy. <laughs> so are you, are you, when you are making a new looping GIF for Instagram, what are you, what are, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to accomplish like fluidity, something silly? Because your characters, even though they're all different, they all fit, like, I feel like they're all the same almost, you know, like even they all look completely different than each other and they're all doing more or less even though they're all doing something different, they're all doing kind of the same thing too. Like they're flopping up and down or stepping really large. You're, you're like rummaging around for something. Oh my gosh, what is that? So that's half of the journals that are filled with. So when did it start? Like 2009, 2008, I started doing, just filling journals with doodles. 
Oh my goodness. And it's just, there's, there's 13, 14 of them now. Um, so I kind of just draw and draw and draw in the journals and then I'll, I'll pick ones that really intrigue me. Um, uh, I've realized about my, I, I realized when I was studying illustration that my imagination, things are moving. When I, when I think of a character or anything like that, I, I think like a filmmaker. I don't think like a, an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, illustrators boil things down to a single nugget, one image that shows everything and, and explains the story and illustrates it, gets it across. Um, for me, it'd have to be a storyboard. And I'd want to say this, then this, then this, then this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to bog down an image saying four or five things at once. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That, that fluidity is just the way my imagination works. So I found when I, when I doodle characters, they're moving generally, like they're walking or they're dancing or something. And then like, if I could, if I had the time, I'd animate all of them. <laughs> but it kind of becomes this kind of, like you pick through and like if, when I get in the zone, if I've drawn a couple of pages, then I can look at them and go, they're kind of moving on the page. I can imagine them moving. And I'm like, which one of these do I want to actually draw? Yeah. You yeah. know, and then I, then I draw it. So that's yeah. interesting though, because you teach illustration. Um, yeah. And you're, you're like professionally trained in that too. Mm. So do you, do you like switch between the two different mentalities when you're working on two different things? Yeah. And graphic design. So I did postgrad graduate, uh, a graduate diploma of graphic design. Because it was a, um, what did I have? I had a diploma of illustration. So that's like the trade qualification. Mm. And then um, you kind of need a degree or post-grad to move up uh, in wage within that in institution and all of that sort of stuff. So I needed to do something post-grad. Well, I, I wanted, I didn't want to do a degree because I've been, I had so much experience out in the industry. And I found out about these graduate diplomas that are like a one year, uh, one year course that would put me above a degree. Huh. Um, so I interviewed and I got um, basically the industry experience that I had gave me the clout to, to move into the course. And I, I wanted to do animation, but I couldn't do that at night. I'd have to, I'd have to take a year off and, and go do a master's or something like that in animation. And I, I didn't want to do that. So I was working, you know, teaching four days and studying at night. Um, yeah, going straight from teaching to go to go study uh, to get that. So, yeah, so I, I why am I talking about that? Um, so I, I understand graphic design, I understand illustration and I understand animation. So it's gotcha. like they're very different mindsets. Um, and gotcha. you have to yeah. fix between them, you know. So a, a filmmaker wants to tell the story piece by piece. An illustrator wants to boil things down. If they can do more than one and, and you know, like a children's book or something like that, they will. But you're generally boiling something down. So you, you, you're telling a lot with one image. And then a graphic designer is kind of problem solving, you know, figuring out what visuals, what, what, what we need to make to, to solve the problem for the client. Gotcha. So you sort of flip back and forth between these things, you know. Like, well, you just boiled them down individually, and I kind of liked how you summed them up. So maybe we should chat a little bit about your experience teaching students and whatnot. Um, yeah. What, what is kind of, I guess, what is the one of the biggest challenges that you see students who are looking to enter the marketplace, be it in illustration or animation or graphic design or whatnot? Um, what is the biggest challenge you see them facing these days? And like, why do they come to be professionally trained, I guess? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's different for everyone. Like, I'll spend the first couple of weeks with them. Um, the first, so I teach digital. That's the unit that I teach. And then um, um, we have a, a, another lecturer, um, Warren Crossett, teaches the traditional media stuff. Mm. Traditional media is kind of the bread and butter of that course. Um, and then in digital, I, I walk them through. So we spend the first eight weeks going through Illustrator and Photoshop. And um, that whole time I get them to work in their journals. I want them to kind of 
I mean, this is my journey, and I, and I, I, I think it's pretty universal. Is you you enter a course, you've only made work for yourself. You're quite possibly not really showing it to anyone else ever. So it's yeah. really personal. It's really individual, and it might it, it might be a way of you coping with being in the world. It might be very inward and personal. And you've got to kind of go from that to outward, not for you, but for other people, but with an awareness of what it is that you do, what that introspective stuff is and how you get that out into the world and how to re make that resonate with other people. So it's kind of, that's the first goal is to go from inward to outward. If you, you know, and it, it can still be like, there's something really personal about all of this stuff. You're kind of showing your inner world and sharing that with other people and they, you know, you can keep that completely inward and share it. And then other people will empathize and feel, feel that for themselves, but it's still, it's, it's gotta be for them. Like you, you're making it with an intention for it to be empathetic. You know, you're empathizing with them as much as they're empathizing with you. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know, but, um, it's, like on graduating, finding your audience, finding your voice, all of that sort of stuff, it's really hard. We do a, a with, when we start that branding brief, well, I, I do it at, at the start of, so the, they work in their journals. We use the, the work from their journals to complete digital exercises, very generic digital exercises that teach Illustrator and Photoshop skills, but they use images from their journals. So it's partly finding their inner, whatever that inner voice is, then when we come to do the branding brief, I try to dissect their work and, and help them and get them to work in teams to look at their work objectively in terms of its form and its content. So the, what the work looks like, so its elements, you know, like line, shape, tone, texture, color, describe those things rank those things in order so is line most important to your work is shape is it color what is it um and then sort of relate it you know try and put it in the world and try to externalize it from yourself because ah. i think that's really important that they're not it's not you because if it's you and then you're out there in the world and a client says i fucking hate that <laughs> If it's you, then they hate you. <laughs> right. Yeah. That makes drawing, sense. They, don't, don't, they don't like their drawing. You do another drawing. Everything's fine. Jesus. <laughs> Is it hard to make that jump for a lot of students um, in, in the kind of switching the mental mode from I'm outputting something that's very internal and personal to me to I'm uh, being of service to somebody who's paying for my work to create something for them, I guess? It's huge. Yeah. It's a huge what is What is the biggest thing that helps somebody switch the mentality of that? Well, all of the projects are brief driven. So, mm -hmm. you know, they've got the dimensions, they've got all of that. We'll model ourselves on, on being the client. Um, and, you know, that, that just kind of builds as we go. But we can't, we can't make the briefs too strict because we're not churning out sausages. We don't want everyone to draw the same thing. Yeah. So it becomes there's a bit of mental leap involved. I try to encourage the idea of writing like a return brief. So, mm. you know, something I, I've done quite a bit working professionally, regurgitate the conversation that you've had back and forth with the potential client as to what they want to confirm that you know it, you know that they know that you know that they know what they want. And if you do it in your own words, then they can, they can go, well, I, I didn't mean that I meant this. Right. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And yeah. then when you, when you deliver on that, there's a much clearer expectation from both parties yeah. and, and it's much closer to the what both people want, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Makes sense. So another another question I had for you that was kind of tied to this um, and kind of being a student and going out into the real world is when do you think people should consider themselves like a professional artist versus like, oh, you know, like I like drawing as a hobby. Is it is it because a lot of people say, well, once you have your first client, then you're a professional artist. But do you think there's uh, like what point should somebody consider themselves as an artist? I don't know. Oh, I was camping the other the other weekend. Um, we went with a whole bunch of different families to this weird co-op camp 
you had to light a fire to to set to light a fire in the morning to boil the water for the hot water system so you could have a hot shower just like really rustic really regional stuff and i was doodling you know in my journal and then um i found this toy i liked so i set it up and i was drawing it and all the kids came and like all the adults were preparing food and stuff like that so i felt like i was being lazy but then all the kids came and they all started drawing with me and i gave them stuff to draw with and what this this little girl she just looked at me and went you should call yourself an artist <laughs> and it was like um it was like oh maybe i should <laughs> like I, I don't think it fucking matters yeah you know? i don't think it matters at all so why do people think it matters then because like a lot of a lot of people oh, like put anxiety. importance to it i reckon yeah. it's just an anxiety i don't know I think, I think I, when I'm working professionally, I am. And when I'm not, I'm not. It's not. Fair. And okay. they're, both, they're both good. Okay. <laughs> you need to do both. Um, a lot of people, like, um, when I started Loop to Loop, it was a, a lot of the time it was because our industry in Melbourne was really small. And... Um, that was really heartening in a lot of ways because there were these like these worn nuggety humans who worked on production and then they would go to the next production and the next production and they were just really reliable hard-working animators or, or storyboard artists or whatever and I, I i know most of those people now and i really admire them because they just they have that that go and that grind to just do that and do that and do that but a lot of them would have their personal thing that they'd like to do or um, they'd say, I wish I had time to make a personal project or whatever. And having that screening meant that they could. And having it be a loop meant that it could be five frames long. One guy did a two frame one once and it was just <laughs> so good. Yeah. Um, he was an illustrator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should look him up. Andrew Bowler. Andrew Bowler. He's amazing. How do you spell his uh, last name? Andrew? Uh, Bowler, like B-O-W-L-E-R. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, they're just amazing. And I wanted, like, they all had their, their dream idea and their pitch that they wanted to make and all that sort of stuff. Um, and there are other people as well that just, because you get in that grind of working those long days on a production, you don't do anything for yourself because you, you're done in anyway and you're going to wreck your neck and your back and shoulders and stuff. And they all had carpal tunnel and things probably. Um, so I wanted them to have that opportunity. Yeah. And I wanted to see what they would make, you know, from self, from a selfish perspective. I'm like, what would that person make if they could make whatever they wanted? And like, that's something your folio needs is not just the professional work you've done, but the fantasy jobs that you still want to do. Otherwise it becomes, you, it, you typecast yourself. Yeah. But showing people the work that you have done and then getting more of that work. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I was going to ask you about Loop to Loop too, but it kind of just sounds like you gave the whole spiel on it. So where is it at right now? I mean, you do a month, um, every other month. Six months, months off. Oh. six months off from, um, from it, it's been going for like eight and a half years. Wow. So how many how many loops do you get submitted every every other month? It's slowed down a bit now. When we first started, it was like a steady sort of 30, 40, 50, something like that. Oh, wow. um, when it went international, it got nuts. And if we have like a really simple theme that someone can just go, oh, I'll, I'll make that. So we did dog. And we got like 230 submissions or something. Um, so I whittle it down to the top 100 if it's over 100. Okay. If it's under 100, then I'll sort of, I'll take out some that I just feel I have to take out. But, um, you know, it's, I, I like that it's kind of like an open mic night for animators. I like that it's, it's, it's fairly, you know, it's open to students, professionals, um, amateurs, whatever, you know, whatever they, whatever. Yeah someone wants to animate something and then puts their heart into it and is outward about it. So they know it's going to be screened and they want to entertain an audience. Then I reckon it's great. So yeah. you've been running it for eight and a half years. And part of the purpose was just to kind of give animators in the industry a break and see what they'd make. 
How have you seen, I guess, the market in Australia, uh, like the animation market in Australia, change over all of that time? Um, it's changed really well. Things are, things are really good. Yeah. Um, at, at the start of last year, so the start of like 2018, there was about three or four, maybe five different studios all making shows. And all the people that graduated the year before from... Um, from the big animation courses, they all got work. Hmm. You know, well, not all, but you know, a lot. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. got work, um, and that was incredible. Um, and then, you know, that that's all kind of ended, and there are there are different things popping up and coming and going. But there was just that magical little little moment where it was like this this burgeoning industry. Um, Sydney's doing really well now. They uh, Nickelodeon. Got their uh, the Andy Suriano uh, Ninja Turtles series, ah, yeah. the new one that was made in Sydney. Um, some of those Sydney guys are incredible. Um, and Adelaide's got has got some stuff going on in uh, Brisbane. There's a show called Bluey that's um, being made. So okay, Cat right. Drummond, Cat Drummond, who runs the the Brisbane um, screenings of Loop to Loop, she um, she was art director on that. It's it's an incredible show. If you haven't seen Bluey. If you want a good insight into like a, a like a, a regular suburban Australian family, it's a pretty <laughs> good, pretty good one. Like they're blue healer dogs as a family. Um, the guy who does the voice of the dad was uh, in a band that I loved when I was growing up called Custard. Uh, it, it's so good. It's so fun. So this is, I just looked it up. This looks like a preschool show or is like just from the it's art? Like is it kids show? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's yeah. kind of like. Um, it looks really cute. Early primary school, I think. Yeah. Uh, hey. But it, little Littlies love it too. Like, yeah. And it cuts <laughs> down all, it's, it's very, um, it's very Australian. Like a, a lot of our shows, a lot of our shows, especially for children are very earnest and they're, they're worried about doing the wrong thing in front of kids. But this show is just, it just feels like our culture. Like it feels like it's, it's more like what you get from, from something from New Zealand or something like that. They're very good at, just showing their culture warts and all and embracing it. Like, yeah, I think Bluey is on the right track, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that kind of wraps up everything. I mean, we talked about kind of where you started and the industry and uh, Instagram and all that jazz. Is there anything else that you wanted to share or like where you're headed next? Um, oh, well, one thing with, with Loop to Loop is that like I didn't create it out of out of a vacuum. Um, there was a um, there was another screening that that bar had before I started it. Ah. But, uh, it was started at a at a college in the city, RMIT. Um, their students were just encouraged to make a personal project every month, show up to that bar with it on a memory stick, <laughs> give it to our Sarah who ran it, and she would just put them all into PowerPoint press play and whatever was there would, would be played. And it was so fun. That and sounds I, like a lot of fun. Yeah, it was just called Animation Club. Nice. And uh, it was really warts and all just weird and fun. And I found out about it um, and just started going along and, and submitting things. And I, I took it really seriously because I, I didn't know that it was a student thing. <laughs> And I really treated it like an open mic night. Like I was like, oh, I want to show the thing. And I'd spend a month on the thing, you know, and put them in. And I got really hungry with that. And then it ended in December of 2010 because there just wasn't anyone submitting except for me. I think the last one was me and my wife. Mel, Mel made one as well. She was making them as well. Um, it was right before we had kids. Um, and... Yeah, it stopped. And then four months later, I hadn't animated because I didn't have that, that thing, that deadline. So I was like, well, let's make one, you know? And the bar was called, the bar is called Loop. It's oh, Loop. there you go. <laughs> yeah. So they do galleries and things like that. There's a Loop project space and bar, and they do amazing things for, for Melbourne art culture. Um, so, yeah, Loop. So it's not, yeah. <laughs> Not particularly clever. I just connected some dots. <laughs> I love how you and your wife are the, it's like the only people submitting, like spending all month with super professional 
<laughs> animations. <laughs> it's really that's awesome, though. You know what you like to do, and, and you do it, and that's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one question I guess I, I didn't ask was where do you, like, how do you maintain stamina or motivation over a long period of time? Like, you post every day. Like, um, I post it's every just part day. of your process, I guess. It's part of the process, yeah. Like, if I don't, if I don't, I don't, I'm not as happy. So yeah, fair. it's, it's just, uh, it's built in. But uh, I mean, like, there's an, another guy that I, I teach with, Dean, um, Dean Jones, who is an amazing painter. Um, and, and Warren Crossett, like, if you look him up, he won a, a big, the big national portrait prize in Australia, like a huge portrait prize. Um, I draw really simply like really simple little cartoon things. And that's part of, it's part of a way to do it. Like I, I can draw really elaborate things, but I don't, I don't have that time. So I draw really, really simply. I don't put clothes on my characters. I just keep yeah. using lobby things because it, it all takes time otherwise. You know, if you have to think about folds and creases or, or light sources or any of that sort of stuff, you're just not going to get it done. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of compromise involved. But I found I was really happy to find that there was professional work for doing this weird thing. Because um, I think it's kind of like you don't need permission. A part of the, you know how you were asking about course things. You, you enroll in a course partly for bit, get, to get permission to call yourself an artist or a professional or whatever. But yeah. doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, it you get better at it, you, you improve, but at the same time, everyone goes, oh, well, I guess that's legitimate. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, I, yeah. If, if the first one of these that I, that I posted, it'd be like, what the hell, what, why? Why? Yeah. What's this one off thing? Yeah. Chris is like, oh, he has 50,000 of them. So it's a thing. Yeah, so it's a thing. He's not going anywhere. He seems to do them quite quickly. Um, we could fill some space with that on our website, you know? <laughs> By the way, I looked up the, um, the Warren, Warren Crossett's uh, prize. Um, yeah. It's the Moran prize. And apparently it's the uh, biggest portrait prize in the world. He got $150,000 for this portrait that he did. Yeah. I've actually seen his portrait. It went around the internet at some point. So all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. That's right. awesome. Yeah. But he can't do that on the train. Yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> yeah. coming on the train and there's like, he's doing this giant oil painting. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's quite a good foil, like to have the two of us teaching because yeah. we're We'll sure, probably sure. contradict each other a fair bit, and um, our, our, our styles certainly contradict, but also, also complement each other. So there's room for a cartoonist in the course, and there's room for a realist, and there's room for, for everyone in between. Yeah. Mm. And that probably you play on different strengths, or sorry, different types of students and how they learn play to those strengths that you have too. I yeah. Guess. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, is there anything else you want to share just before we uh, wrap it up? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's wrap it up. All right, dude. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It really was. It's so nice to meet you after following you. for Like, I started following you right when I started getting into Instagram with my daily comic. And it's so yeah. weird how you, like, I have this, like, persona of who you are in my mind. And, like, all that's blown away by, like, meeting you in real life three <laughs> years later. Or Skype life, I guess. I think I had no bones. It'd just be this you had no bones. You just have, well, I had no, I, I, just, I don't even know what I thought, you know, like, am I who I turned out to be in your mind, I guess? Uh, <laughs> I just yeah. draw mice and, and like stick figure eggs for a year. <laughs> yeah, dude. I was, I was, I was really excited when I, I, yeah, when I found that, because I think you were probably, what, a month into it, probably, by the, when, yeah. when I spotted it. Yeah. I think, you, mu you must have followed me first, but then I, I followed you almost immediately afterwards. I really like that you you comment, you you interact. And uh, like it, this is an extension of that. Like you're running this podcast and it's, it's yeah. so good. 
Because um, you know it's you know it's funny that you say that. I had I had like a weird. I had a weird moment over the last day because I gained an, a thousand followers from yesterday. Whoa! And, what? Yeah, and, well, Galdi's, who's, uh, he has like, I don't know, almost a million followers on, on Instagram tagged. He like put me in his story being like, here's one of my favorite animators, which I'm like completely blown away by. Yeah, yeah. But a thousand people followed me in like less than 24 hours. And <laughs> like Instagram for me, I've always really enjoyed commenting and like DMing people that I enjoy their work and like bouncing back and forth. But it, it feels a little bit overwhelming to have like a thousand people follow me and like, I, I don't know how to interact with that, you know? Like, so I put out a story being like, thanks for following me. Here's a little bit of info about me. Like, reach out to me if you want. But it, it feels like some of the personal, like what I like connecting with people is almost lost when there's so many new yeah, yeah. people following my work like i don't i don't know how to handle that <laughs> i mean it's nice the but at, at the same will be watching them all go away again yeah pro- well that's really- what i expect like i'm yeah. not gonna post another uh, they're all following they're me because of the wizard back. animation yeah but i'm not gonna post another wizard animation tomorrow they're gonna have to wait like another year <laughs> <laughs> with um the chain smokers thing so many people followed me yeah. And it's still trickling away now. Like they just they just sort of trickle out the door because they're like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is not go, EDM music. <laughs> yeah, how did this get in my feed? Like yeah. I, I really like it. I really think it's funny. Like um, but yeah, I I first like Instagram to me was my sketchbook. Um and it was just me and a few close friends using this weird um 70s photo filter app to to talk to each other (laughs) facebook bought it and turned it into something else and now like facebook it's it's so ubiquitous that everyone has a different idea of what it is and what it's for so there's still people photographing their food i know right yeah but but there's niches for that i have a friend who um uh, it's called Toronto Brunch Club, her handle, and she has like 5,000 people following her. And all she does is like she goes around to different restaurants in Toronto and eats brunch there and like post pictures. And she's got like a really niche, like involved community going on. And it's great. <laughs> My friend Simone does snack review. She ah. looks like weird snacks. She finds them and just does the, like a very, very funny review for them, which is uh, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It's all like, these, yeah, all these weird things that people do. Totally. Yeah. So many sub communities, which I think is great because you can, when I want to, sometimes I involve myself in those communities when I happen to connect with something. So, mm. yeah, cool. Well, um, anyway, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Appreciate yeah. it a lot. It was Thanks nice to chat. Yeah. yeah. And if you're listening and you'd like to follow Neil or get in touch with him, you can do so by going to his Instagram, uh, which is the Boogly, and I'll include a link to that in the description of this podcast. And that is all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, bye. bye.